Okay, welcome back, everyone. It's good to see you all again. Number four. Um, some quick announcements before we start up uh, for today. Oh, you all set? Good. All right. Um, so uh, we have our second uh, sort of outing lab happening this week. Actually, it's a third. So I guess we have kind of night lab over the building across the way. Um, but this is the second one that's done by Scripps, uh, uh, Scripps Institute of Oceanography. Um, this is a bioluminescence lab. We're going to be visiting the Dehane lab. Uh, uh, Dimitri Dehane is a research here, a faculty member here at SIO, and he, his whole research involves bioluminescence, so studying light forms by fluorescence or studying natural bioluminescence, the light that actually light organisms make on their own. So it's, a, it's going to be sort of an interesting entryway to when we start talking about life more formally uh, starting uh, on tomorrow. In fact, um, and so t because we have that lab uh, scheduled on Thursday, we're going to do the same kind of thing where we're going to back up lecture to tomorrow. But unfortunately, the 4 to 5 p.m. Uh, slot, there's actually a speaker here tomorrow that I'm supposed to host. And it's generally kind of rude to, if you're hosting the speaker, to then kind of leave to teach a class. So um, we're going to swap the problem session and the discussion section on tomorrow. So the problem session, so the session where you're going over homework problems, questions on the homework, questions on just solving uh, problems. That's going to be at 4 o'clock, uh, and Kurt's going to lead that. And then we're going to have the lecture at 7 o'clock in this room. So not over at Center 220 or 222, but in this room. So if you're available at 7 o'clock, please come to the lecture there. If you're unable to come to 7 o'clock, that's not part of our normal lecture scheduled time, so I understand. Um, the lecture should be online afterwards. We've been hosting everything on YouTube. Um, but uh, I do encourage you to please come, especially since we're going to have two excellent presentations on news reports that day, and I don't want you to miss them. Um, so I'm looking at both of you. <laughs> All right, so uh, that's that's this week. Um, and then looking ahead, a uh, reminder that next week we're going to be having our midterm. Uh, that's going to be covering all of the material up to chapter six, which is kind of everything about Earth, uh, sort of the basics of astronomy, the basics of the universe, and as we talk about this coming week, uh, the sort of basics of life. Is there a question? Do you have a question? Um, is the bioluminescence thing on at this time? Yeah, it'll be at this time. So just like the beach lab, will be you have to you will want to go down the script. Let's just point that out. So. When we did the beach lab, uh, we walked down to this sort of end of this kind of driveway down to the beach. The Hubs Hall is actually just above that. In fact, we could actually see it when we're down at the beach. So just north of that, just up on the hill. So either you can take the, the, the script shuttle and just walk down the road the same way. Uh, there's actually a second script stop that's a little bit earlier, and it's across where you work. What's that stop name? I don't know what the name is. You just know to get off. But it's like after the curve. Yeah, so yeah, it's at, so as you're going down the road, there's like the last curve where it straightens out and there's like a bridge, right? It's before the bridge. Before the bridge, okay. So you can get off at that stop, and, and that stop is kind of up here somewhere, and you can walk down, or you can get off here, or you can take the 30, there's multiple ways to get down there, all right? Or you can bike down, or you can walk down, or you can drive down, all right? Lots of ways. But you had practice last week, so it's good. You can fly down, yeah. There's a glider part, you can glide right in. I don't know if that's a landing point there, but all right. All right, so um, so that'll be, make sure to get there as close to 9.30 as, as possible. Um, we'll start, start promptly there. Um, it's going to be sort of an hour of demonstration and sort of, uh, I actually have no idea what you guys are doing, kind of manipulating the bioluminescence stuff. Um, the, we won't have a lab, like a lab worksheet like we had for the beach lab. Um, you'll be writing up a kind of reflection paper based on what you've, you've uh, sort of learned from that, from that visit. So that be it. Okay, any questions on that? Okay. All right, <clears throat> and then the last uh, thing, just as announcements. Um, so I'm already starting to fall behind, which happens invariably when you do a subject that covers absolutely every science that's uh, available to teach. So um, because we didn't quite get all the way through magnesium and atmosphere, we're going to cover that today, talk about atmosphere and the carbon cycle. We're going to start on life on Wednesday, so tomorrow. Uh, and then in order to fit everything in to get to the actual history of life, um, we're going to have another lecture on Wednesday here uh, before our midterm. Now, because these are happening just before the midterm, this lecture is happening just before the midterm, this stuff is not going to be on the midterm because it's a little bit too close to the testing time. Uh, but it will be part of the final exam later on and, of course, part of the homework assignment for the following week. Um, so I encourage you that. And we will still have our midterm review uh, during the problem session for that week. 
Yes, ma'am. So basically, the midterm is just kind of like one through five. Because, like, for midterm itself. Yes, actually, you're right. It'll just be one through five. Okay. One through five or six. Good, okay. good observation. Yeah, one through five. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Uh, so let's do. Oh, so let's actually start with this. So we're going to have uh, two news reports today. Uh, Sanjeev Reddy is going to be talking about organic molecules found in young plants, planet protoplanetary disk. And Merlin's going to be talking about uh, solar eruptions and their effect on unprotected plants, which is perfectly timed for today. Good job. Um, good. All right. Last minute choice always works really well. Okay, so Sanjeev, come on up. So um, a few weeks ago in the galaxy not so far away, we discovered something pretty amazing. So um, there's a star system, or a star just called MWC 480, and it's uh, only a million years old, so it's a very, very young star. The uh, system is still in its nascent stages, and it's, the star itself is about twice as large as the sun when it comes to volume. But we found this star, and um, we also discovered that the composition of the compounds and elements surrounding it is very similar to that of which it's very similar to what our solar system had in its early years. And something that was most notable was that a satellite called ALMA, which is a radio satellite in Chile, it's called, it stands for Atacama Large Millimeter Array. This radio satellite found methyl cyanide and hydrogen cyanide in the protoplanetary disk, which is basically the clump of matter and gases and dust surrounding the star. And it found these elements uh, surrounding the young star. And basically, we found these elements at a distance of 2.3 to 9.8 billion light, uh, no, 9.2.3 to 9.8 billion miles away from the center of the star, which, when we compare it to our own solar system, if we scaled it down, is roughly similar to where the uh, Kuiper belt is. Is that how you say it? Kuiper belt. Kuiper belt. Yeah, yeah the Kuiper belt, which is a, a belt of comets and small icy bodies, which is just a little bit further away from Neptune, and this is where most comets form and most icy bodies form. And um, these icy bodies and comets, in the early stages of the uh, solar system, trapped uh, compounds very similar to what we found. So we have comets that have methyl cyanide and hydrogen cyanide, and those were trapped into comets and icy bodies, which peppered the Earth in its early stages. And we believe that this is what brought um, organic compounds to Earth in the very beginning. And um, so that's what it says here. Compounds will eventually be collected in comets or transport. So right now, the system is very young. It's only a million years old. So there hasn't been any time for planets to form or um, matter to clump together. But we believe that once the planets form and once the matter has time to congregate, that uh, this organic matter will get trapped into comets. And hopefully, when planets do form, the comets could then transport this organic matter into the planet's atmosphere and surfaces. So also, um, these elements, these compounds, methyl cyanide and hydrogen cyanide, contain carbon-nitrogen bonds, which are extremely crucial in the formation of amino acids. And amino acids are pretty much what make life possible on Earth. And there was a study conducted in 1952 by um, Yuri and Miller. And what they did was they, they hypothesized what, what are the elements that we, we would find in Earth's early atmosphere. And they just put them in a test tube and they just ionized them with electricity to simulate lightning strikes. And what they found was that amino acids literally just form out of nothingness. The, um, the compounds, the elements come together, they form amino acids, and they thought that this was how life could have possibly formed, just the ionization of elements forming amino acids. So, as I said, once the comets bring these compounds into the atmospheres of planets, there's a high chance that they could form amino acids because the uh, the elements carbon and nitrogen that we find in these um, in this in these comets are used to make amino acids. So that just basically means that we could have life in this system in a few billion years. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Take two. <clears throat> yes, sir. Um, what was the ALMA thing? Is that a satellite or a telescope? It's an array of radio satellites uh, located in the Atacama Desert in Chile. And it's just, what it does is it looks for radio signatures of um, 
different chemical elements. And just uh, it also studies local stars and the formation of these stars. So I think they're they are they're public telescopes. The satellites we usually think of things that have been space. Right, right, yeah. So I've had three yeah. issues. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. just, just, just a term, yeah. Yeah, really? Um so did the Alma like find like a particle of it or it detected the radio signatures of um, those two compounds. Okay. And those are the compounds that we believe could lead to future life in the system. So it didn't like come back to Earth? Like no. The, no, okay. And yeah, it's 455 light years away, so it's not too close. Yeah. How far away is the galaxy? Oh, no, it's not a galaxy. It's, it's in the Milky Way. But it's just, oh, and, yeah, that's that's a star, MWC 480. Oh, okay. And it's twice as large as the sun, and it's 455 light years away from our own solar system. Yeah, astronomy, like, name terminology is sometimes very obscure. So you've probably seen, like, Messier 5 or something like that, and those are usually galaxies. This is just a catalog of radio sources, really, or mid mid sources. So. Okay. Thank you so much. Great. Oh, you want to you want to do one question? What? No. Okay. I was right. just embarrassed because I saw that there's. Oh no no right there. no no no. <laughs> Don't be embarrassed by obscure astronomy nomenclature. It happens all the time. Okay, so remember you're writing down some notes uh, to uh, sort of uh, point out the good points and the suggestions for improvement for SMD. Now we'll hear from Mervin on this. Morning, guys. So today we're going to be talking about uh, coronal mass ejections. As the professor talked about last week, it's basically the like basically a solar flare that comes off from the sun over here. And this I'm going to be talking about a study today that was published on April 9th in the Journal of Geophysical uh, Studies. And it talks about how the they, the study basically talks about the importance of the Earth's magne, uh, magnetosphere and how important it is to it, uh, the role it plays in making it habitable for life against uh, CMEs. So apparently the data seems to, seems to suggest that for the planet to keep an atmosphere, the, there needs to be a magnetosphere to protect it from all these uh, solar flares. So in this uh, article, the, they go over data, uh, they, they go over data which was provided by the Venus Express since 2006. And this uh, satellite was in orbit around Venus for the last eight to nine years. So basically, they're trying to see the difference in effects between a fast CME, which sort of like goes out really, really fast and has like a bow of a shock wave, like basically in a, like waves, like a boat going through waves. You'll see like there's a shock wave in front of it. So that's what happens when there's a fast CME. For a slow one, it's sort of like, like they described, uh, those that move more slowly, like a fog rolling in. So on December 23rd, 2006, they observed data which determined that Venus leaked atmosphere at one of the highest uh, densities ever. And they sort of connect this to a solar flare that happened like four days earlier. And uh, basically the slow CME had a, uh, had a greater effect on it because it seemed to be like uh, a slow buildup and then over a longer period of time. So they seem to the, they seem to suggest in this study that uh, the magnetosphere plays like super big uh, important role in protecting the atmosphere and making the planet like habitable, uh, habitable for life. That's pretty much it. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, two questions. Yeah, no. Um, so you said that, well, the scientists said that the long, the slow waves are more like, um, do more harms to the planet than the fast ones? No, they're just studying the effects of like, between the fast and slow. This one, on this in this article, they just covered the slow one. So it would be interesting to see how they follow up on like, a fast CME on Venus, the effects of that on Venus. So to see whether it's up to par with the but then again, like if it's fast, wouldn't the impact more like big though, the intensity of itself? Rather, I mean, I understand like the yeah. slow would be like long period of time, yeah. but like if it's 
fast, like the impact would be like way larger than the slow ones. That's, that's what they, what that's thinking. a possibility. That's what they said. Okay. But they're going through over like eight or nine years of data. So they just actually just published this. So okay. they're still looking through the data. So who knows, maybe down like maybe six months from now, it'll come out with another study. Another question. So imagine if like Earth didn't have the magnetosphere, basically we'd be bleeding off atmosphere, like constantly. Mm -hmm. So it, it would end up pretty much like Mars, because Mars magnetosphere sort of like shrunk. Right? So Mars, I think the atmosphere was how, how dense was it? Like less than. We don't really know because yeah. we don't have uh, obviously any data from back then, and it's hard to get that out of the the, uh, the rock. Uh, record. So someday, if we can drill deep, drill deep into the ice of Mars polar caps, that might be something we can find out. But right now, we just have speculation. Yes, sir. Uh, do the CMEs ever reach the surface of Venus? Because I, I know there's a lot of clouds and dense gas. Yeah, actually, Venus is really dense. And the scientists in the article they speculate that maybe that's the cause for Venus being the atmosphere being so dense. Like all the CMEs hitting it every time, and without the magnetosphere to protect it, so that might be it. Like all the lighter particles, like oxygen, helium, got get blown off into space, and then the heavier parts just remain on the planet. That's what they speculate. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Marty. Okay, so uh, by the way, I want to point out a couple of really nice things there. Uh, in both those cases, there was discussion of the instruments that made the measurements. All right, all of these are, you know, observations that we make in space. So it's important to discuss how we actually make those observations. Sometimes it involves new technology. Sometimes it involves having satellites that actually orbit around the planet that you're studying. Um, so make sure when you're talking about that, either in your news report or in your future presentation. Uh, that you also talk about the, the, the methodology in which we know this information. It's always important to know how we know the data, not just what the data is. Okay, okay. any other questions? Okay, let's do a quick review on what we covered uh, last week, or at least last Wednesday. Uh, remember, this is a shout out, so you can shout out at will. There's no, no raising hands needed. Uh, what three of the geologic processes that most affect life? Volcanism, plate tectonics. What's not a tectonic activity? Planetary magnetic field. So erosion is is a weathering effect, and that's something that we have because we have an atmosphere. So we may touch on that uh, when we talk about carbon. But the magnetism is an important part of tectonic activity. Or tectonic activity is part of. Oops. Oh, it's part of what's happening in the interior of the Earth. And the magnetic field of our Earth is actually generated. That might be a question, so I'm not going to say. Okay, <laughs> hold on. We'll talk about that thing. All right, what's the ultimate power source for all this tectonic activity? Bingo. Let's all say it together. What's the ultimate power of this activity? Radioactive, Radioactive decay. All right, it's the conversion of mass into energy, into heat. You know, mass energy into heat energy, and that's 90% of the heat that's coming in and out of the Earth. We still get some heat from the sun, and we still get a little bit of heat, a tiny little bit of heat from this very slow differentiation, but most of that's already finished, right? The collapse of the Earth, the differentiation of the Earth, that's mostly done. What we get left over now is the activity, and that's powering all of this tectonic activity, just the decay of heavy elements. Um, okay, terrestrial planets that currently exhibit active plate tectonics, which ones? Any others? First. Just keep guessing, you'll get all four of them. All right, so I will agree with Earth. What about Venus? Venus. Wait, is it Mars in there? Oh, I'll get to Mars. So okay. what about okay. Venus? <coughs> no. no. No plate tectonics. How about Mars? No. Did it ever have plate tectonics? Yes. How do we know? Volcanoes. Okay. Well, volcanoes is a uh, is remember this, there's three separate things here. There's volcanism, tectonics, and magnetic activity. So, volcanism means that there was some kind of tectonic activity. 
do we have any evidence that Mars had plate tectonics? This is actually a, an expert question for those of you who looked into Mars a little bit more detail. I guess nobody has looked into Mars in more detail. Um, has anyone heard of the Valley Marineris? The largest canyon in the solar system. Not caused by erosion, it's caused by plate tectonics. So Mars definitely had plate tectonics in the past, pretty active plate tectonics, but does it have it today? No. What's the only planet in the solar system that has plate tectonics today? Earth. 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 That's it. Okay. So that's that's special about Earth. Um, how about uh, planets are currently exhibiting volcanism? Venus. Earth, Venus, anything else? No, nope, that's it. So again, Mars has had volcanism in the past, right? Mars has this tremendously large Mount Olympus, sorry, vol volcano that's bigger than any volcano here on Earth, um, but it's not actively erupting. So uh, that part of the tectonic between Mars has also gone away. But Venus appears to be still volcanically active. All right. Um, and what about terrestrial planets that currently exhibit magnetic fields? Strong magnetic fields. Earth. Earth. Anyone else? We just heard about Venus. Does Venus have strong magnetic fields? No, nope, it's evaporating. How about Mars? So Mars has a little bit, but tiny, very and very localized. It's not sort of the big magnetic field we have here on Earth. Anybody know about Mercury? As I do your reading, Mercury has a little bit of magnetic field, and it's probably a remnant field from its past. And probably still there because Mar Mercury is made mostly of metals. And so those metals have actually retained a magnetic field. So often Mercury is quoted as having a magnetic field, but definitely the one that has the strongest magnetic field in the terrestrial planets, not in the whole solar system, but at least in the terrestrial planets, is the Earth. So Earth is special because it's got all three of these different tectonic processes happening. None of the other terrestrial planets have all three happening at the same time. All right, last question. The Earth's magnetic field protects us from the solar wind. We just told us that, right? From the solar wind, all right? And, and the importance of protection from the solar wind is what? Why do we need protection from the solar wind? What is it going to do? So there's some radiation effect, right? It's highly energized charged particles, although most of those get absorbed by our atmosphere. What happens to the atmosphere as a result? It gets destroyed. Well, it gets stripped away, right? When you send something very high energy into a gas, you give the gas that energy. If that gas has more energy, more thermal motion, it's more likely to escape from the gravitational pull of the Earth, right? So there is a chain of reactions when you have this high energy uh, impact happening to the atmosphere. That's something that can strip the atmosphere. Uh, as we're going to talk about, we can see that happening in Venus today, and we think that happened at, at Mars in the past. Okay, any questions on those? Okay. All right, so um, this picture has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but we're going to say we're going to finish up our discussion of the Earth talk about the atmosphere, and talk about some of the very important processes that happen uh, in the sort of atmosphere-lithosphere interaction uh, that are critical for having life on Earth, and, and more importantly, sustaining life on Earth. And these are sort of the important uh, negative, negative feedback processes that happen, uh, particularly in the carbon cycle. Um, but just so generally, you know, the, you know, when we think about atmosphere, this is just gas, right? This is the stuff that we're breathing. Um, and it's the stuff that we're breathing that's gravitationally bound to the Earth. Uh, and that's actually important, very minor, but should be kind of obvious point, is that in order to have an atmosphere, we have to have a planet that has enough surface gravity to keep that atmosphere in place. And so later on, as we we're going to talk about sort of the outer parts of the solar system, like the very small moons or the Kuiper Belt objects, those things are very tiny. And they do have atmospheres, but they're very, very thin atmospheres, because they simply don't have the gravity to retain those gases to the surface. So we're fortunately beyond the heaviest and densest planet in the terrestrial zone. And so we have a fairly significant atmosphere, although not the thickest atmosphere, which is interesting. Um, the part that we think of as atmosphere that we actually breathe is actually pretty, it's a pretty thin skin. It's only 10 kilometers. 10 kilometers is something you can walk in like, you know, kind of fast you walk like a couple hours. That's not very far. And that's how thin of a skin we have of atmosphere above us, uh, which is always scary to me, but it's, you know, that's what it is. Um, and because the, you're balancing sort of the gravity that's pulling the atmosphere down, uh, the tendency of the atmosphere to want to fly away because of just thermal pressure, 
uh, there is a gradient in the pressure and the temperature of the atmosphere as you go up. And so uh, we, can, we can solve for that actually pretty simply with uh, physical laws. Uh, but just keep that in mind that we're, when, as you go up, you're going to lower pressures in the atmosphere. And so when we talk about the upper atmosphere, it gets really, really thin out there. Now, uh, comparing our atmosphere to other planets, uh, it's kind of in the middle of the, in terms of the properties of pressure and temperature. Right? We define this unit of pressure called a bar as equal to 1 as the average here on Earth. So that's kind of an Earth-based metric. Remember, sometimes we redefine our units to be normalized to something that's you know, sort of a standard. So the Earth is a good standard for an atmosphere. So we define pressure in units of, sort of Earth atmospheres, bars. Um, Venus is a much thicker atmosphere. It's about 100 times the surface pressure on the surface. And Mercury, I'm sorry, Mars is a much, much thinner atmosphere, about 100 the size. So we're sort of logarithmic, some, logarithmically somewhere in the middle there. Uh, and we're also kind of in the middle in terms of temperature. We'll talk a little bit more about why the temperature is so different. What's most interesting, though, is that these two planets, Mars and Venus, and we don't, we're not going to talk about Mercury very much because Mercury's atmosphere is extremely thin, just very barely at the surface, and usually gets baked off uh, when Mercury faces the sun. Um, the atmospheres are very different in composition. So Venus and Mars are mostly carbon dioxide, 95-96%. Right? That's the major component of the gas of the atmosphere. And that doesn't even register when we look at the top gases in, in Earth's atmosphere. Our atmosphere is mostly nitrogen and oxygen, which doesn't show up at all in these other atmospheres. So we have a very, very different atmosphere compared to Venus and Mars. And as we'll talk about later, that's not something that started on Earth, right? We actually, based on sort of our understanding of the evolution of Earth in terms of its organisms, in terms of atmosphere, we probably had a very similar atmosphere as these other planets. But it's actually life that drove us to this very different kind of atmosphere. Right? This is one of the major impacts of a, of a biological sphere on Earth, is change the atmosphere to what it is today, a completely different set of gases. Now, where does, where does all this gas come from? So there's several different sources for uh, having atmospheres. The one we're going to talk about the most is, in fact, I think much of our atmosphere actually comes from the inside of our Earth through volcanoes. Um, if you stand next to a volcano, how many of you have ever visited a volcano? Northern California, or Hawaii, or anywhere else. What volcanoes have you guys want to do? Well, I was in a Bali Island in Indonesia. Oh, okay, cool. Those are real volcanoes. Yeah. Uh, it was like the tall one. It was like Mauna Loa. Okay, Mauna Loa. Yeah. You went to Palas and Costa Rica? Costa Rica, nice. Did you, did you go to a volcano? Someone in the back of the volcano. Yeah, where did you go? Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens, okay. Re very recently active volcano in my lifetime. Um, so, you know, when you stand by a volcano, it's usually given off some kind of gas. And this is mostly superheated sort of uh, either fluids or materials that were initially attached to rocks that have been vaporized by the heat inside the atmosphere. Uh, now, if you're next to a, a relatively active volcano, uh, one of the things you'll smell a lot of is hydrogen sulfide, right? This is the stuff that smells like rotten eggs. Uh, it smells like rotten eggs because rotten eggs give off hydrogen sulfide when they rot. That's why they smell the same, right? The same chemical. <coughs> But um, you know, even just looking at the rate at which uh, volcanic gases are coming out of our relatively inactive volcanic systems today, which are still, you know, we still have some fairly major volcanoes happening, um, it doesn't take too long to build something like our Earth's atmosphere, uh, even on sort of our volcanic scale today. So we think that much of our atmosphere probably came from volcanic eruptions, and these are the primary gases that come out of those eruptions: carbon dioxide, water, and hydrogen sulfide. Right? We can measure that from volcanic eruptions today. Remember that these are the gases that are on Venus and Mars, mostly carbon dioxide and some nitrogen. So this is at least evidence that Mars and Venus, their atmospheres come from the, at least, you know, likely the same source because they have the same chemical imprint. But again, the Earth is much more different because we've, we've actually changed it. Life has changed it, for example. All right, now other places you can have is you just have evaporation, right? You have evaporation off the ocean. If you have evaporation off dry land, right? If it gets really hot in the day, you evaporate water out. All right, you transpire from plants, right? That's a source of atmosphere. Um, you can also have particles, uh, high energy particles, like from the solar wind impacting the surface, and that will create a very small amount of atmosphere. We think, for example, the very thin atmospheres that are present on asteroids are mostly from impact from particles, right? They're not volcanically active, they're not tectonically active, they're very weak in gravity, so most of that gas goes away. So something that must, something must be there to keep it supplying it, and then we think that something is just particles hitting the surfaces of the planet. 
of the, of the planet points. All right, now, the interesting thing is, so we think the gases come from there, but notice this, this gas right here, water, right? Water is another, you know, steam, right? We talk about steam vents. If you go to Yosemite, you'll see the geyser, you know, the geyser there, those are water geysers. There's a steam coming out of the center of the earth as well. I think much of that water is actually locked up in the sort of mineralized rocks, the hydrated minerals that are inside the earth, and it's released when it's heated. This is, of course, going to condense very quickly on the surface of the Earth. And so one of the theories about not just where the atmosphere comes from, but also where the oceans come from, are volcanic eruptions. Right? So that steam coming off could condense out. That could supply at least some proportion of the oceans that we have here on Earth. This, by the way, is a huge mystery because we shouldn't have as much water on our planet as we should. Uh, and the, there was a discussion about the protoplanetary disk. The region where the Earth formed early in the protoplanetary disk was mostly devoid of water, at least in terms of ice, because it was too hot. Right? Vaporize, it would fly away. It's not a good place for ice to form. So ice had to come here somehow. And the two main theories are either it's delivered by comets. You've probably heard that theory. right? That was also related to the protoplanetary disk idea. Or it just baked out of the inside of the Earth from hydrated minerals. Right? Both of those are still ideas that people are trying to figure out. All right, so there's some of the other things. By the way, another possibility is that we have all this hydrogen sulfide. We don't have a lot of hydrogen sulfide in our air, which is a good thing because hydrogen sulfide is a poison uh, for, for us oxygen-breathing folks. Um, one of the possibilities is that early life forms are actually hydrogen sulfide uh, eaters, right? We call these hemoautotrophs. They create mass or they create their bodies out of consuming chemicals. We'll talk about autotrophs and phototrophs and all this stuff uh, um, tomorrow. But the reaction that these organisms do, and these are still in existence, right? They're still micro microbes that, that metabolize sulfur. Uh, they eat up the sulfide with carbon dioxide, right? <coughs> Two of the things that are coming out of the volcanoes, right? So there's the resources. And one of the things they produce out is water as well. So again, it could be volcanic activity, could be comets hitting the earth, or it could be that we, being life forms, were the ones that produced the oceans in the first place. The oceans may just be a big waste dump for these sulfur-eating molecules, or sulfur-eating by uh, uh, microbes. But that's good. We like water, so like, let them keep wasting. All right, so now those are sources. Um, atmosphere also has, you know, it's an open vent, right? You know, you, don't, you can't close the window on the atmosphere. So there are ways of getting rid of the atmosphere. Uh, either having it escape out just from the thermal motions, right? Very high energy uh, 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 atoms can have just enough energy to escape from, the, from the, gra the gravitational pull of the Earth. And that in particular is one way we think, for example, some of the light elements have escaped from our Earth. Right? We don't have a lot of hydrogen or helium in our atmosphere, and that's probably just escaped from some thermal motions. Um, you can also, if you don't have a magnetic field, have that sweeped away by the solar wind. But you can also have events that happen down the Earth where you condense out, for example, into water or you. Uh, uh, the rocks on, on Mars are very rusty, they're red. That rust is a combination of iron, which probably are just the rocks from the surface. And what else makes rust? Water. Well, water helps, but it's actually oxygen. Oxygen is a gas in the air. So we think a lot of the oxygen on Mars, not in the air, is actually locked up in the rocks. It's condensed onto the surface through chemical reactions. And then, of course, you can have a big thing hit something that blows the atmosphere away. Uh, we haven't seen too much evidence of that yet, but we'll, we'll talk about those kind of events later on. So, um, oh, and so again, magnetic fields help retain the atmosphere by keeping at least this part of the atmosphere rejection uh, process from happening. All right, now I mentioned that the atmosphere uh, changes with density as you go up. So I'm going to show this plot in sort of different forms. What this is showing is. Uh, this is a temperature versus altitude plot, right? So the red line here is the temperature of the atmosphere. Notice that it's not a simple function, right? It doesn't just, say, get hot on the surface and get cold out in space, which you kind of expect it would. It actually has lots of little curves. We'll talk about that in a moment. But keep in mind, again, that the pressure is going from high to low uh, in these kind of altitude plots. So the part that we breathe down here is, is called the troposphere. I'd say I'm not really that concerned if you remember the names of these things. These are just names. But it's more important to think about sort of the structure of the atmosphere and what it's actually doing. 
Um, again, this is the part where we breathe, and it turns out this is also the part that is uh, most directly in contact with the radiation from the surface of the Earth. And so that radiation, which is coming out of infrared wavelengths, is heating the atmosphere from the bottom. That's why we have high temperatures that go down as we go up. <coughs> and just like the mantle, if the heating is enough, you can transport energy not just through radiation, but also through convection, just like you're boiling water. And that kind of convection is what drives a lot of our weather patterns. So uh, this sort of gradient in temperature from high to low is one of the main sources of weather here on Earth. And that weather happens in the troposphere in the various lowest levels of our atmosphere. <clears throat> uh, the next sort of big section of it is called the stratosphere. Uh, and this is a section that of the atmosphere that absorbs out, in particular, ultraviolet light. So uh, we've shown a sort of uh, picture of what the, what kind of light reaches the surface of the Earth. I'll show that again later on. But here on Earth, we can see visible and radio waves and a little bit of infrared light coming to us from the, from space. Ultraviolet light is stopped in our atmosphere up in the stratosphere, and it's stopped by a very specific molecule, and that's ozone. Um, so uh, we have this layer of ozone that sort of forms something like 20 or 30 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. And this substance is a very strong ultraviolet absorber. The structure of this molecule is such that it, it's, uh, you know, its molecular bonds are very, very uh, tight and very high energy. And so they can absorb ultraviolet light just as a molecule. Now, this is hugely critical for life as we know it because the kind of radiation that we're talking about, ultraviolet light, which is about, uh, about uh, 0.1 microns, um, very short, short wavelength, very high energy, is exactly the energy that can break bonds in our DNA, in our carbohydrates, and the proteins. If we didn't have this ultraviolet shield, not only would you get a very bad sunburn, but we would be rampant with cancers. The amazing thing is that this ozone forms from oxygen, which is the stuff we breathe. So, the waste, at least from plants, is the thing that also protects plants and also animals and most of the sort of DNA-based life on Earth from immediately mutating and having a hard time sort of, you know, carrying its genes forward as, as the next generations. That ozone is hugely crucial. And many of you know that, you know, over uh, the last sort of decades, uh, we had this sort of hole open up in the ozone layer on the southern hemisphere. Uh, from chlorofluorocarbons, the stuff that used to be in radiators and refrigerators and air conditioning units, and it probably is in some of the old ones. Uh, that has been sort of reversed a little bit, but that hole is actually still there. And we see much higher UV radiation in the southern, uh, southern hemisphere down in Antarctica, and we actually see a concomitant, conc a higher rate of mutations amongst the animals that live down there. So ozone layer is no, you know, it's, it's serious business. We actually need it for your life on Earth. But it's something that's here on the Earth because of life on Earth. So kind of this interesting logical loop. <clears throat> All right, so the next, the sort of top of the atmosphere, sort of about 80 kilometers or higher, very thin part of the atmosphere is called the thermosphere and exosphere. Uh, this is the part of the region of the atmosphere that's most directly in contact with space. And your initial sort of assumption should be, well, space is cold, right? There's not much out there. Right? The only sort of thing that's heating space for the most part is the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is only 4 Kelvin, which is very cold. Right? But when we actually look at the atmosphere's temperature, it does this really remarkable, so this is low temperatures down here, it actually becomes much, much hotter as we go higher, higher in the atmosphere. How in the world does that happen? Why would the atmosphere get hot as it gets closer to space? So how does something get hot? Yes, sir. <clears throat> okay, good. So that's a definition for temperature, that temperature is the average kinetic energy. So if something gets hotter, the kinetic energy of the molecule is getting higher and higher. How do we drive the kinetic energy? How do we make things move more? What do we need? A source of... Energy. Okay, so what are the possible energy sources at the very top of the atmosphere? The sun. Yeah, it's on the slide. I'm waiting for people to read it. It's right there. So 
the top of the atmosphere is the part of the atmosphere that's mostly directly exposed to the sun, right? That's, you know, it's sun, nothing but space, and then the top of the atmosphere. And in particular, not just the, uh, the sort of radiation that we get from the sun that enters the ground, but the radiation that doesn't make the ground. And that's the highest energy form of the radiation. X-rays, high energy ultraviolet rays, gamma rays, there's very few gamma rays from the sun, but they make it to the atmosphere. Also cosmic rays and things that are very high energy particles that come out from other parts of space. All of this is bombarding the very outer parts of the atmosphere, which is very thin. So all that energy makes a big difference, right? You take a ton of energy and put it in a very thick atmosphere, it doesn't do very much. In a very thin atmosphere, all those molecules go crazy, bonkers. Right? So the temperature is rising out here because we are orbiting a star. And in fact, we see this in all of the atmospheres with terrestrial planets. The outer parts of the atmosphere is the thermosphere, thermo meaning temperature, thermo meaning heat is hot because of its interaction with the sun and also cosmic rays. Yes, ma'am? Oh, the pressure gets weaker as the altitude goes up, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, the, the highest pressure is down here in part because all of the atmosphere is above it, so it's squishing it, right? So that's going to create higher pressure. When you're up here, you've only got this much of the atmosphere pushing it down. So that's the main reason you get lower pressures at high altitudes. Same thing in the, in the sea, right? You've been deep sea diving, the pressure goes up really fast as you go underwater, clear your nose and stuff like that. Right? Same thing happens in the atmosphere, just much more slowly. Okay, so this, these high energy radiations, they're enough to knock electrons off atoms. They turn them into ions, and we call this the ionosphere. You probably heard that term before. But the important thing is not so much the term, but the idea that the ionosphere is because there are ions there, and those ions are because of the high energy radiation uh, from the Earth. Okay. All right, so. So this our atmosphere has all this structure. Yes, ma'am. Um, back to the image of that. Yeah. So what is happening at the boundary layers that causes that radiation? So like, like right here? Just at, at any sort of kink in the temperature. Yeah, yeah. It's decreasing and decreasing is what's happening. Yeah, thank you. So 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 this is just the further you get from the surface, which is the heat radiating from the earth, mm -hmm. the further you get, the less heat you get. So it's getting colder. This reversal here. It's this ultraviolet radiation being absorbed by the ozone layer. So the ozone layer sits right about here, 50 kilometers. It's absorbing all that radiation and it's getting hot. So it's actually the same reason as the sun. As you get a little bit higher up, you don't have the same, you don't actually have that ozone layer anymore, so you don't have anything that's absorbing out that UV radiation. So now you don't have the energy being deposited in the atmosphere, it gets cold again. And then out here is where all the X-rays get absorbed. And then it gets hot again. So there is, yeah, these sort of kinks are mostly due to where different forms of light are absorbed from the sun. Good question. Any other questions? Good observation too, by the way. I would have missed that. Yes. And so is like negative, or, so zero degrees Celsius is considered hot at that, at that stage. Yeah, it seems to be <laughs> zero degrees Celsius is actually a fairly warm atmosphere. It drops off very quickly to below freezing. Um, you know, if you ever go flying in an airplane, now like they have these sort of screens that tell you like where you are on the planet and how fast you're moving. So that one of them is the temperature. So next time you fly, see what temperature it is when it's outside. It's usually down in sort of the minus 40, minus 60 degrees range. Usually minus 40 is about the coldest thing. Yes, ma'am. Is it all throughout? Is it the same? Well, not the same, but like the chart of the temperature is like seen throughout the surface? Ah, excellent question. So is this yeah. is this temperature profile the same all around the Earth? And and it's and it's in these regions it's pretty similar because the atmosphere is fairly well mixed at high altitudes because it's so low density. Down here you can get pretty large variations. And all you have to think about is you know this is this is marked as 20 degrees Celsius at the surface of the Earth. You just have to go to you know, the Mojave Desert or the middle of summer or somewhere in the middle of Australia, and you're over here at 40 or 50 degrees Celsius. So you can have quite a lot of variation here, which will then heat up the atmosphere across. Uh, I should say that that will heat up the atmosphere across. It will still get down to very low temperatures at some certain point because that's sort of more dictated by the sun than the earth heating it. Um, and if it's a really steep temperature gradient, then you get really large convective motions. That's how it gets the heat out. And that's when you get really large thunderstorms, for example. So, you know, out in the summer in the Midwest, they have huge thunderstorms mostly in the summer because you have this nice absorbing plane of land that just takes all that heat and needs to get rid of it, does it by convection, drives thunderstorms. Okay. 
Okay, so you know, obviously we need the Earth atmosphere because we're breathing it right now. Biochemically, we need the oxygen that's in the atmosphere to break down glucose and to stuff that we make our bodies out of, right? Jack energy. Um, but it's also uh, sort of the source of, sort of balance for the Earth's climate, right? Um, so in terms of the heat, at least at the surface, all right, we talk about heat from the Earth being really important for driving tectonic activity. But once you get above the surface, most of the heat that we have here on Earth is because of the solar radiation. Right? And so how much radiation gets, gets into the Earth or gets to the surface is very critical for setting the temperature uh, at that surface. And so uh, you know, things like whether we're closer or further from the sun is going to change the insulation, but also the reflectivity of our atmosphere and the surface, right? This reflectivity is called albedo. And this is a good example of this. Um, if you have two different surfaces, one that's, say, forested and nice and green, and one that's mostly ice. Ice is a very reflective substance, particularly sort of snow-packed ice, all right? Sort of like crumbly little crystally ice. It's a highly reflective surface. Uh, and so that bounces a lot of the sunlight off which means it's not available for heating the Earth, right? We're not extracting that energy from the sun to heat. We're just sending it right back to where it's coming from. And so this typically, if you get to a point where you have icy surfaces, you tend to stay icy. Whereas if you get to a point where you have an ice-free surface, that can actually retain a lot of the heat and you tend to stay ice-free. There's kind of a divergent point here, which we'll talk about a little bit later, that if you can get to a point where you're either icy or not icy, you tend to stay at those places because of the amount of reflection that happens from these different materials. By the way, if you pave this over like we have been doing, that's also a very high albedo and you tend to cool, unless you pave it with blacktop, which is very low albedo, which makes it really hot. Pavement matters. <coughs> and actually there is asphalt and water. Okay, so so that's two things. And then um, the other thing that's sort of set the how atmosphere interacts with surface temperature is how much of that, again, sunlight is absorbed by the atmosphere itself. Going back to this plot, all right, how much is deposited at these regions where the light is being absorbed by molecules, up here by atoms, by here by ozone molecules, how much of that is being absorbed is also going to change the temperature structure uh, of the atmosphere. And this is in particularly important when we get to something called the greenhouse effect which is uh, something you've probably heard a lot about in terms of carbon dioxide or atmosphere. Um, but it's actually critical to even being warm enough here on Earth uh, so that we have uh, so that we can live on. So uh, to sort of talk about the greenhouse effect, this is a plot I've shown before. This is getting back to what we can actually, what kind of light actually gets to the surface of the Earth. Right? This is in wavelength down here. Right? These are all, it's labeled this is all x-rays down here. Here are the ultraviolet. This rainbow is a visible band. Right? infrared millimeter radio out here. What this line is showing is how much of the light the atmosphere blocks, right? It's something called opacity. And something that's 100% opacity is basically completely opaque. You can't see through it, right? So these parts where you have this line that's flat up here are places where the sunlight can't make it to the surface. And again, I pointed out this ultraviolet region, which is very bad for DNA. It breaks up DNA. but it's the atmosphere is almost completely opaque, mostly because of the oxygen that comes up in the atmosphere, at that sort of 50 kilometer layer in our atmosphere. Right. And then, of course, we can see in the visible because we can see space with our eyes. We can also see out in the radio, and that's why radio telescopes are very useful on the ground. The radio telescopes we talk about today observe out here, and they can see the space like there's no atmosphere there at all. Right. The rest of these regions are absorbed out by various molecules in the atmosphere. So the sun, uh, here's the sun. What wavelengths is the sun emitting most of its energy? What part of the electromagnetic spectrum? Let's be more specific. So UV gamma. Can you write some of these down? I can't give all the answers. Okay, it's more yet. Well, other answers. I think I'm going to do the whole electromagnetic spectrum. What part of the electromagnetic spectrum is the sun brightest in? We've got two possibilities visible. Visible. <laughs> what else? 
Two more. Two more. And red. Okay. All right. You should have your little cards. Here are your four choices. If you don't have a card, there's some in the back. B gamma, C visible, D infrared. What part of the electromagnetic spectrum is the sun brightest? Count of three. One, two, three. All the colors of the rainbow. Go ahead and find someone who next to you who has a different answer. Convince them that you're right. Sometimes your cluster may have to ask out a little bit and turn around. Right. 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 So I want to make sure I clarify my question. The question I asked verbally is what wavelengths is the sun brightest? What is it peak? Um, I actually, this is going to be the same, it's actually the same question. Not only is where it peak, but where does most of the sunlight pass through our atmosphere? Where does most of the sunlight pass through our atmosphere? And where does it peak? It's actually about the same, same wavelengths. Is that clarifying or not clarifying? For each the surface. Does that change people's answers? That's true. No looking up. I'm looking at you. Use your brain. Use your brain. All right. Let's see if that changed answers. Count of three. One, two, three. Yeah, that seemed to change some answers. All right. So most of you have the same answer, which is visible. Visible. That's correct. All right. Right here. Now, the sun looks. Kind of yellow, don't stare at it, but if you do stare at it, it looks kind of yellow, like uh, yellow orange, right? That is right kind of in the middle of the visible band. The reason it looks that color is because that's the peak of the electromagnetic spectrum. A few weeks ago, we had a discussion about light and the black body radiation, black body spectrum, and you could calculate what the peak wavelength is based on the temperature of the sun. For the sun, it's about 6,000 Kelvin as the temperature of the surface, and that peak wavelength corresponds to about 500 nanometers, which is right in the middle of the visible band. So the sun peaks in the visible, and it just so happens that we have a nice hole in opacity in our atmosphere. Light gets to the surface through that, that those wavelengths. That's why we can see out at those wavelengths as well. Right? If we didn't, we would see no space, and there'd be no astronomy, and we'd probably be kind of dumb. Right? But we can see out. That's a good thing. Now, that's the wavelength that the sun emits radiation. Uh, at what wavelength does the Earth emit radiation? Uh, same choices. So think about it for a second. What wavelength or what part of the electromagnetic spectrum does the Earth emit the majority of its radiation? Count of three. One, two, three. Some of you are still flipping your letters. So it's very complicated. All right. Most of you got the same answer, which is what? D, infrared. D, infrared. You get that D, infrared. Uh, it's time to think about it a little bit. Why would the Earth emit at a different part of the electromagnetic spectrum? No, it's not. Yeah, it's not that. What's the about temperature of the surface of the Earth in Kelvin? Kind of nearest 100. 200. 300. 300. Anybody know what the sort of, you know, uh, okay, what's absolute zero in Kelvin? 
Zero. Okay. What's zero Celsius? Negative two seventy-three. Other way around. Two seventy-three. Zero degrees Celsius in Kelvin about two seventy-three. Absolute zero in Celsius minus two seventy-three goes back and forth. So we're about a little bit hotter than that, hopefully, than zero degrees Celsius. Three zero. So we're about three hundred Kelvin. Good estimate. What temperature are you all roughly? Thirty-six point five Celsius. Roughly. Roughly. <laughs> in Kelvin. About 300 ish, yes. So, so about the same time. We are room temperature people, right? Room temperature <laughs> places, we have room temperatures, right? 300 Kelvin peaks right at about, uh, right at about, I have this right actually, about 10 microns. Um, and that's smack dab in the middle of the infrared band. And oops, it's also in the region where we have very strong absorption from these very small molecules. So while sunlight can get in, the radiation that's coming off the surface of the Earth has a much harder time getting out. This opacity spec plot goes from both directions, all right? It's not just sunlight coming in. It's the same for light trying to get out. So while sunlight peaks in a nice place where you get lots of radiation in, the Earth emits in a place where radiation has a hard time getting out. This is the essence of the greenhouse effect, all right? This trapping of radiation, that fact that we can get energy in but have a hard time getting it out. Right? That's the greenhouse. All right, let's keep up these questions. How much time we got? Right. Actually, before we do that, any questions on this? Because we're gonna, I'm going to ask some questions. I want to make sure I answer your questions. Yes, ma'am. Um, around what point would gamma exist? Around like what uh, temperature? Yeah. So gamma is uh, something like. This 0 0.1 nanometers is x-rays, so it's probably going to be 0 0.01 nanometers, 0 0.001 micron. And this is getting to be like, like a million to 10 million degrees Kelvin, probably even hotter than that. Right? It's extremely high temperature radiation. So these are, you know, sources that emit gamma radiation are usually like close to the like accretion points for black hole when matter is being torn to pieces, or neutron stars, which are the very centers of very high mass stars, like places that are extreme, even in physics are strong. Um, there are some high energy particles that emit gamma rays when they decay. So radioact radioactivity, one of the forms of radioactivity is called gamma decay, which emits a gamma photon. But remember that the energy scale for the nucleus is very high because of that strong force. So that's why we get that very high energy radiation. But if it turns a black body, it's millions, millions, tens of millions of degrees Kelvin. Very, very high. Any other questions? It's good to get a feel of the electromagnetic spectrum. We're bathed in it all the time. Okay, let's ask this question. Everyone ready? Count three. Don't show me yet. Count three. One, two, three. Okay, good. We almost all got the same answer, which is B. 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 Here we go down. Why? <laughs> Less sunlight getting in and other radiation, and it's reflected. So, so, so less sunlight getting. Why does that matter? Why is that? What does that matter for the temperature? Um, because the sunlight and other sun radiation. Except the gases in our atmosphere, and also there's less gases. If it's more collective, then they just bounce off. <clears throat> but um, and then less stuff gets trapped inside as well. So this is actually not a greenhouse question. You're you're getting you're actually getting, you're getting ahead of yourself. But yeah, do you have a no? You sure? Okay. Yeah. If you're put more energy plus the atmosphere. So that's actually the key. And it, it seems like kind of an obvious point, but it's the energy that matters, right? Sunlight is a form of radiative energy. If it's reflected, that energy is just going right back out into space. We don't tap into it, right? The more that's absorbed, which is the opposite of reflected, right? Anything that's not reflected is, is, tends to be absorbed or scattered, right? That absorption is energy from the sun is being entered into the Earth system and going into heating the Earth. So 
Reflection reduces the amount of energy absorbed. That's the key, key concept here. Notice I've had like a lot of conversations about energy transfer and conversion. That might be an important point to keep that in mind. All right, here's another question. Three. One, two, three. Oh, interesting. It's about a 50 50 split. That's love that. Okay, find the neighbor next to you has a different answer. Convince them that you're right using scientific arguments. You may have to kind of poke around because you're kind of clumpy. Turn around and you'll find someone. <laughs> Okay, let's see if that changed hearts and minds. Ten of three, one, two, three. <laughs> Well, that's interesting. It, it, actually, it's the same fraction, but different people. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so I'm mostly seeing Bs and Ds, which means you both like a lot, but you're not quite sure which way it goes. Uh, someone who advocates for it going up a lot, can you can you uh, justify your answer? It's about half of you, so don't be scared. You got half people behind you. Yeah. I'm just thinking um, on the graph we looked at. Different parts of the atmosphere block different kinds of energy, but originally, like the energy and the temperature was really, really high, but it was only because of the atmosphere that it was pretty cool by the time it got um, down to Earth's surface. And so, if we didn't have an atmosphere at all, then all the different kinds of waves would be hitting Earth. Uh, okay, so so absorption of the sunlight, some of it's happening in the atmosphere, and if it wasn't happening in the atmosphere, then the Earth would be getting that radiation, so the temperature would go up. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, I said that, but don't we need like, the stratosphere to, like, the stratosphere makes the ozone layer, mm -hmm. and the ozone layer protects us from, like, the, the rays of the sun. So mm -hmm. without that protection, the rays of the sun will be hitting the earth, but, um, with, like, more extreme, so it would help them heat up the earth. Okay, so, so it sounds like the same argument, that without the atmosphere to block some of those high-energy radiations, we would get more high-energy radiation on the earth. Okay? Really? Well, I was gonna say what's kind of building up, but there's no reflection. Like some of them, like our has Earth has to like um, absorb some of the heat, but at the same time it has to reflect some of them out to the space. But um, if there's an atmosphere, there's no function of reflecting it, the heat out of the space. So the atmosphere acts to reflect some of the light. Yeah. So to get rid of the, that reflection, you're absorbing, you're potentially absorbing more heat. Okay. All right. So you so you voted for B. B. Yeah. Okay. How about D's? Any D's? Yes, ma'am. Um, the Earth's surface might be absorbing more radiation, but if it's not retaining it, then it's just going to be contact with the space. It's not going to be that long. Okay. All right. So, so, yeah, the argument for hotter was it's the atmosphere is blocking some of the high radiation. The atmosphere for your atmosphere, the argument for cooler is that the Earth is not a, is. Let me go back here. Removing the atmosphere allows more of the light to get out. Okay. Yes, sir. Well, the reason why it's going to be colder is because even though it will be more intense radiation in the surface, it won't impact at all. So 
this from a plex um, from the ground. OK. So since, since there's no atmosphere, there's nothing to keep it down. OK, so it sounds like, it sounds like the same argument that that the earth, the atmosphere traps some of the heat, and so that's that's what's kind of keeping the earth warm. So yeah. if you got rid of the atmosphere, you begin rid of that trap. Yeah. So we have an example with Mars, like Mars. Oh, has no oh, you're calling on other examples. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Okay. And Mars is two hundred degrees Kelvin. So. Okay. So so Mars has a very low low at small very thin atmosphere, and it's much colder. Is there another reason Mars might be much colder? Well, it is farther away. From Okay. Could be reason too. Uh, that's the idea. Yeah. I was just going to respond to like the Mars has to limit heat because there's no active. So active heat from the interior. So, yeah. so um, one thing that I said very quickly in passing earlier on was that inside the Earth, the majority of the heat's coming from radioactive decay. So that's the sort of power of atomic activity. Once you get to the surface of the Earth, it's actually the sun that's really setting the sort of temperature of the Earth. Certainly, if you're near volcanoes, it's very hot, it be extremely hot. But you don't have to go very far from a volcano for it to get cold again. And Mars has not actually <clears throat> got active volcanoes right now, so it's it's not uh, that's not a source of at least surface heat. So interior heat, it's still there. The surface heat, not so much. But that's a it's a good good point. But I'm, but that's that's why it's not important. It's mostly the asset. Yes. I thought like, because like in space it's really cold. So okay. If you were to, if you're like an astronaut in this space, even if you're, you can see the sun, it should still feel cold. That's how you might hypothesize. Okay. So, the so. See, okay, yeah, so astronaut has no atmosphere around it. <laughs> Too low mass. <laughs> uh, and so. And the question is: Does the atmosphere? Does the astronaut get very cold when they're out in space because they're in contact with space? Okay. Any other points? All right. Twenty seconds. To discuss again. Go. Let's see if that changed any more. <laughs> I'm leaning towards the Wait, is it true that we're like Okay, let's see if that changed that whole discussion changed any any thought parts of mind. So uh, count of three, one, two, three. Actually that did change a lot. Interesting. Okay. So most of you have picked one answer, which is what? Oh, I don't know. Isn't that right? Most of you pick what? D. Most of you pick D. It would go down a lot. Now, y'all presented some really good arguments from both directions, and I want to emphasize that this is a complicated system when you're thinking about absorption from the atmosphere. Now, y'all like, what did, did, I, did we all pick wrong? Uh, in fact, the answer is D. It would go down a lot. It would go down quite a bit, and part of the reason is that so the arguments about absorption of high energy radiation are smack on. That is absolutely true. With, with that high energy radiation hitting the Earth, that would add an extra degree of heating of the surface of the Earth. There's no doubt about that. Um, but the problem is, is our sun peaks at what part of the electromagnetic spectrum? Visible, which means it's emitting less and less of high energy radiation. So our sun's actually not a really large X-ray or gamma ray source. So even though there's going to be more of that radiation coming into the atmosphere, uh, kind of coming to the surface because there's no atmosphere, 
it doesn't actually heat up the, the surface very much. It heats the atmosphere, the upper atmosphere, a lot, not because there's a lot more X-ray and, and gamma radiation, but because what's different about the atmosphere very high up? Less. There's less stuff up there. There's less material, less matter. So a little bit of radiation can actually have a big effect on the temperature because there's a lot, lot less stuff to eat up. But once you get down to the ground, which is nice and solid and very dense, that radiation actually doesn't do as much, at least the high energy radiation. So the big effect is that greenhouse effect, how much of that energy is trapped by the atmosphere and not allowed to escape from the Earth's system. And so this is a, a table showing uh, the effect of the greenhouse effect. And so uh, these are the actual temperatures on the surface of these planets. Uh, so you can see here is, uh, Earth is about 15 degrees Celsius, which is about room temperature. If it wasn't, if we didn't have an atmosphere, we would be at minus 16 degrees Celsius, the 30 degrees swing, right? 30 degree difference, just on the greenhouse effect alone. We didn't have that atmosphere, we didn't have a greenhouse effect, everything would be frozen, which is actually not great for life, right? Particularly life that lives on the surface of the planet. So we actually need that greenhouse effect. Now here, let's check out Venus. Venus is crazy, right? Venus is 500 degrees Celsius, 500 degrees Kelvin, the greenhouse effect. And that's because Venus is hugely thick uh, atmosphere of carbon dioxide. Uh, Mars is very thin atmosphere, so it does not have a big effect, but there is a little bit of greenhouse, only about 6 degrees Celsius, not enough to get much higher. Right, here's Mars, right? It goes from minus 56 to minus 50. It's still pretty pretty terrible, at least in terms of cold, right? There's a little bit of greenhouse effect because of all the carbon dioxide, but because the atmosphere is so thin, it's not very much. So greenhouse effect really is one of the major components which sets the temperature for our planet, all right? The first being how far we are from the sun. That's the most important thing. But that greenhouse effect can have a huge effect. And it can have, you know, an effect that's actually bigger than in terms of whether you're close to the sun or not. Right? 500 degrees just from the atmosphere for Venus. Right? It would be hotter just because it's closer to the sun, but that would be that much hotter. Right? That's all greenhouse effect. All right. Um, let's see. Okay, now the other reason that so one of the reasons that Venus is so has such a huge greenhouse effect is remember this composition of the atmosphere, 96% carbon dioxide. Right? We worry about carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas because it is a very strong absorber in the infrared. Right? We have hardly any of it in our atmosphere, right? 400 parts per million, right? Tiny, tiny, tiny percentage. Or it's 96% of the atmosphere of Venus. Right? So Venus, at some point in its history, because that carbon dioxide is coming from volcanism, had to have had some kind of runaway greenhouse effect. Right? So in fact, if we took, even if we took our Earth, and we put it into Venus's orbit, there's a couple things that would happen to our planet. So first of all, the water, because the surface is hotter, because we're a little closer to the surface of the Earth, that water vapor would actually get evaporated into the atmosphere. Who cares? It would just rain out, right? No problem. Well, it turns out that carbon dioxide is one of our greenhouse gases. One of the worst greenhouse gases turns out to be water. So if you evaporate the oceans, and you, by the way, you can see this when you're in green in little greenhouses, right? Little, you know, like glass-contained houses and stuff like that. The glass provides part of the UV block, or sorry, the infrared block. Uh, but the water vapor in the atmosphere and in the greenhouse itself is also a major contributor to heat uh, retention in those things. So as water vapor evaporates out, you get higher temperatures, that it causes more water to evaporate off, you get higher temperatures, it's a runaway effect. And we think that just where Venus happened to be in its orbit, if it had any kind of water on the surface, any kind of oceans, and remember, we think that the oceans may have come on Earth just from volcanism, and we know Venus has volcanism. So there's no doubt that water could have emerged on Venus. But if that all evaporated up, if we took all of the oceans up into our atmosphere, the greenhouse effect of that is tremendous and it would keep our planet permanently too hot for liquid water on surface. So we actually don't really have to worry about carbon dioxide that much. It's not really that much carbon dioxide, fortunately, because of the plants. Right? They take up most of that carbon dioxide. But where you don't have any biological activity, and where you've evaporated all of the oceans of the atmosphere, the greenhouse effect is so much that you permanently move to this state of very hot, hot surface, right? even though you're just a little closer to the sun. Now, on Mars, of course, Mars also has carbon dioxide, but because it has no atmosphere, its greenhouse effect is very tiny. 
so you don't have a lot of heating on Mars. But as uh, was suggested early on in sort of the news talk, it may be that Mars had a thicker atmosphere in the past, and scientists sort of looking at sort of the effect of ero erosion of the atmosphere from, from the neosphere, sort of argue that at some point in the past, Mars would have had enough greenhouse effect to keep liquid water on its surface. And so this is a sort of artistic picture of what Mars might have looked like, uh, say, in its first billion years of its evolution. Uh, because of the sort of arc, the uh, geology and sort of the, the, the altitude of, of Mars, uh, it would have had this sort of nice, huge global ocean. Uh, that's because it would have been hot enough for the water to be on the surface. Now, whether it had water is a whole other question. What uh, Ah, good question. So, <clears throat> one of the things that's in the notes, and I didn't have enough time to talk about in great detail, that heating mechanism, radioactivity, right? That's what's driving all this tectonic, tectonic activity. Mars is a smaller planet. So as a result, how much does it have more or less radioactive material in its, in its interior, just on size alone? A lot less. And it's also lower density, which means it has fewer metals. And so it also has less radioactivity. So the idea is that um, Mars essentially has frozen. That radioactive decay reduces over time. The heating reduces over time because the, the decay you know, it drops off over time. And so at some point, Mars just got to the point where the heat production from reactivity was not enough to drive any more technology. Okay. We think we see this in, in fact, all of the terrestrial planets and the moons, except Earth. Earth is the last one to not have this freeze up happen. <clears throat> Now, one of the reasons we think this is a true story is, as we'll talk about Mars later on, we see lots of evidence that Mars had water on its surface in the past. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Um, Sorry. So <laughs> <laughs> end, of the, end of the class. I'm getting punchy. Um, so, you told me so that sunlight is in the same Yeah. Is that characteristic of Earth, or is that the Is it different from Mars? Um, so, we can see the surface of Mars from space. Mm -hmm. It's not opaque. We can see it. So visible light will also go up. We can't see Venus. And part of that is that Venus has other chemicals in its atmosphere that are and it's so thick that, that the opacity is creeped up where the, where the opacity is zero. So Venus is in a weird case because not a lot of sunlight gets in because it's absorbed out. Nothing really gets out because of the, because of the sort of same atmosphere. And most of the heating on, on Venus is coming from the sort of trapped heat that just, just stays there. It won't go away. So there's a little bit of sunlight gets in, and it all gets trapped, and it keeps temperature very high. So it does vary. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. It varies based on how thick their atmospheres are, what the of the atmosphere are. Um, but the way you know is if you can see the surface. If you can see the surface, you get an opacity window. If you can't, it's blocked. OK, uh, so that's all the time I got. We'll have, you can look at the notes for the carbon cycle. Um, remember that tomorrow we're going to have our problem session at 4. Our lecture at seven here, and then our lab on Thursday. Question? So lecture will be posted online, so you'll be able to see it. Yes, ma'am.